Friday Night Racing on Off The Ball. Brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. Love every racing moment. Visit hri.ie. And you are very welcome along to this week's edition of Friday Night Racing. Every Friday afternoon at 3 o'clock on all of OTB social channels, we broadcast Friday Night Racing. Brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. Love every racing moment. Visit hri.ie. You can follow the Twitter account at HRI Racing and the hashtag is every racing moment. I'm not going to start this week's show by talking about the tote tend to follow where I have managed somehow miraculously to uh, get ahead of Johnny. I'm not going to mention that straight off the bat because to do so would be childish, it would be churlish, it would be immature of me to rub it in at the start and it would really set a bad tone for the rest of the hour. So I'm going to wait until about you know half an hour in to bring it up, Johnny. Is it's that okay? Like, it's like those when somebody calls in on the radio and just says, oh, can I say hello to such and such and such? And by the time they've mentioned everyone, the DJ can't actually say no. So, so well, you've just said it there. So you got that out of the way, Ger. I did. Uh, speaking of uh, traditional radio uh, DJ hosts, uh, long, time, long time watcher, long time listener, first time caller, David Egan, how are you? Very well, how are you guys, Ger, Johnny? Good to speak to you. It's good to have a fan of the show on the show. Uh, after having one of the best weeks of their lives. This is fantastic. How are you getting on? Yeah, very well, thanks. Just in between rides, I'm actually looking out the window here to uh, the horses walk around with the non-thorps, so, so it's an exciting race to upcoming now in a second. He's a exclusive news that you're going to retire because of your winnings on Mishriff alone this year. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. I think the sort of the, the fame and the, and the winnings only drives me more to try and win more also, if you races. Go- if you go as long as your dad, you've another 34 years left or something like that. That's it. He's, he's got a full book at Chester tomorrow where he loves riding winners around. So, he, uh, yeah, he's still banging in the winners. He rode a, a double last week, so he's uh, in good form anyway. Let's talk about this week before we get back into um, uh, the the year that it's been. Um, the the Judmont is one of those races that's kind of on the calendar that I, I guess people circle and you talk about. What was the experience like this week? Um, you know, I think... We're all just getting used to having crowds back properly uh, and it's obviously a bone of contention here. But for you this week, what was it actually like on Wednesday? Yeah, yeah funny you say that about the crowds. I felt York this week, the atmosphere was so electric and the fans are right in on top of you, especially around the parade ring because they've got that tier system. They surround the parade ring and even cantering down, you could really see, feel the presence of the fans, whereas... Royal Ascot, there was a lot of people there, but I almost felt like it was even busier here. So, uh, look, to have that, to cross the line in front, comfortably passing the Judmont and cantering past the winning post afterwards and just standing Mr. up and letting him look up at the stands with a crowd full of cheering people, it's, it was the best feeling in the world. Yeah, and York is a special place as well. I, I've actually, I was only there once. It was when Frankel won the, the equivalent race, actually, David. But uh, it is a kind of a unique place for the Seabor Festival, isn't it? Yeah, look, it's it's a tremendous track. Um, of course, a lot of the you talk to a lot of the southern jockeys, they maybe don't make too many trips up north. But when they talk about York, it's it's a world class race track very forgiving, nice flat track with a long straight, so you can ride sort of any type of horse, or you can ride a horses, you can go and make the run in here, or you can ride a more patient race and come through them with the long straight, and uh, it's just great all around, and the team at York here always have the ground in top class condition, and uh, it's always great, great horses running here, so it's fantastic. And th- this was a quality renewal of the race, like obviously you could point at the odd horse that wasn't there, but... Juan Elcano is rated 113, he was sent off 40 to 1. You've alcohol free, you know, has had such a good year. Max Sweeney, obviously, who's dropping back in trip, having won the Irish Guineas. Mohafet, who was a derby contender at one point. Love, who was basically the horse of the year going into this season. And none of them even finished anywhere near you, or second. Yeah, it was an exceptional performance from Mishriff. Um I always knew he had a big run in him like that. And uh, it was great to see him do that in the Judmont, which was a race that the Prince and Mr. Gosden had lined out. This was his group one for the taking here in this country. Obviously, he's done a lot of his campaign and abroad, but sort of he had a nice break after he did his travels in the Middle East, and he probably did probably a shade too well because he came back. He wasn't near peak fitness, but look, he needed that run, get that freshness out of him, and he improved a lot immensely when he went for the second behind the derby winner and the king george and i thought i said to everyone look if you can improve 
as much as he did from his first run to his second run onto his third run. He'll take a lot of beat, not thinking he actually would improve that much because it was a big step up from his Eclipse run to his King George run. And then I think he's almost topped his improvement. The way he did it, the way he cruised into the race. I love the way he got in a lovely rhythm. He's a horse who's, wouldn't call him free going, but he's got a low head carriage. It takes a bit of settling. You need to get him in a nice rhythm. And we were in the perfect position. We're in the position I wanted to be, that I planned to be in, sort of looking through the form and whatnot. And uh, no, I couldn't have gone better. It took me into the race. And when I asked him to sort of extend that stride, sort of just before the two pole, he never stopped all the way to the line. So to be able to do that and crush a top class field was was uh, a great feeling to, to be on top of him. Uh, and he did crush them. If we go back to the eclipse when he travelled so well in the race and sort of say Mark Silica left him for dead, he ended up finishing third. Like I suppose we can now say with the benefit of hindsight that he was too fresh then or as you said he had done too well for his break. Yeah, look, he's he obviously deserved to have a good break and Mr. Gosden he knows how to train these top class horses for certain targets and there's no point in having these horses primed 100 percent for their first run of the year when he's got a long campaign in this country and then could go abroad to obviously there's been talks about him going to the yark the Breeders cup and even the japan cup wow. not to mention the middle later on so he's got a long season ahead of him so he needs to enjoy these breaks when he gets them and it's important not to rush these top class horses because we know he's got it in him and he'll naturally come to hand and look he did run fresh at me it was it was a small field a day I made the running didn't go a sedate pace but went probably slow enough that Mishriff was probably wanted to go a stride quicker than he was allowed to and what actually surprised me watching back the race I actually took some Marks Basilica off the bridle and got him under pressure for sort of a far long 100 yards and it looks like if Mishriff was on point that day, he, the way he quickened into the race, if he had kept going, he could have put, put a good race up to St. Mark's Basilica. So, uh, no, he's a fantastic horse to be connected with and I'm just very grateful to be the lucky man on board. It's a good story, so like I'm not saying obviously the owner is short of cash, but he's by make believe. Who wouldn't, you know, he would have by the time this horse was born, make believe would have been in the very early stages as a stallion or whatever. Um, and he has massively, massively advertised him and his own credentials, obviously, when he retires. But like I guess you're talking about the three races he's raced in this year, taking on three year olds, taking on seven year olds, taking on horses of his same age, four year old. That's flat racing at its best in some respects, and doing it in a kind of a globe trotting level as well. Yeah, it's a credit to. Prince Faisal and Ted Vow, his racing manager, he bred Mishriff. He owned Make, he, I think he bought Make Believe, but Mishriff's mother, he has the family going back six, seven generations. So, so to breed this bloodline all down through the years, older than I'm born, older than most young people in racing are born, to have that first sort of start off mare to bring them through and to have a horse like Mishriff, it's, it's what dreams are made of. I know being connected with a horse, being able to ride him, but to own him and to breed a horse like that must be very special for the, the prince. I'm always really interested in, in your own reactions as a jockey in the middle of the race when you feel like everything's going well. Is there is there a point when you're up against St. Mark's Basilica and, and you know, you say in retrospect, you, you see that you were putting it up to St. Mark's Basilica, but actually is there a point in the race where you know that it's gone even just before the rest of the world knows it's gone? And likewise, is there a point in the race on Wednesday where you know you've got it even before the rest of the world knows it? Yeah, I knew I knew when I turned into the straight on Sandown, he'd done a little bit too much with me throughout the race. He wasn't like keen in fighting me, but he's just using excess energy that on a normal day, if he was in a nice rhythm, he'd be saving energy on the way around, which he probably didn't do in Sandown. I was trying to hold on to him for as long as I could because I know he probably wasn't going to get up the hill first run of the year. And uh, look, it wasn't to be that day, but it was probably a blessing in the sky. He's progressed with every run. In the King George, I got a bit excited when we turned into the straight. We passed Love and we were coming up to a day as Gertz. I thought we were really going to put up a fight, but he's just a top-class horse over a stiff mile and a half. He probably just stays a lot better than Mishriff does over that trip. Um, I knew I was over the moon, the position I got after a far long in the, in the Judmont, but I knew turning in the way he was cruising into the race the energy saved, being in such a good rhythm throughout. I knew I could let him slide nice and early because he stays out this flat. 
Monaco really well on this ground. It, it all worked worked perfect, and I knew I knew at an early stage in the race that we had the we had the race at the, at our mercy. That that's that's what interests me. You're saying what interests you? What 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 feeling a jockey has? It's like you said there. I was very happy with my position after a furlong. Now this is a race run over a, a mile and a quarter and change. Um, it's not a big field. So why did it matter where you were after a furlong? I mean, if you're if if you're flagging it in a marathon, a mile and two is a long long way from home yes after a furlong alone you were really happy with where you were and almost like uh, maybe 50 percent happier almost than after the gates yeah i look when i had i could see obviously kevin manning went forward on mr bulger's horse i had tom mark on in front of me and ryan in the box seat position i think love jumped a tad slower awkwardly with ryan and i thought ryan was the horse that was going to go out and make the run and I predicted that Tom Markham was going to sit second on the outside of Love, and I'd have them two, the horses I thought I had to be in my sights. And when I saw Love was in the box seat position, we didn't go a phonetic pace. I knew I had the turn of foot once I got my lad rolling and got first run on the field, that uh, that he was going to be very hard to beat. I knew the the Shadwell horse in behind me was the horse with probably the most turn of foot in the race. He's probably a mile of connections and said they're going to drop him back to a mile because I knew he was sitting right behind me and I knew I had to sort of get going nice and early and stretch him because sort of I, if I had stayed in behind uh, Alan Kerr, probably a mile and a half horse and let Jim Crowley come up on my outside and not box me in, but he could have a little bit more toe than me. I thought it was the right thing to do to let him slide and stretch him up the straight and that's what we did. Shadwell horse probably didn't stay and they're going to drop him back but it, um, it was one of those races where if you could script it beforehand and write down exactly what you wanted to happen that's what I had planned out and it Plan A worked out perfect. That's why I think in running jockeys would be so interesting. Over the two minutes, like David Egan could be just into the microphone saying, I "Have it now." Happy <laughs> days, happy days. I'm, yeah. I'm perfectly happy with where I am. Horse in front of me is a mile and a half. Horse love doesn't necessarily seem to be going. I'm so happy. You can't, you can't if say you that though. You horse think it's horse go and collect effectively. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. And David's a confident young man. <laughs> that's that's something I always thought about. Do you know, with um, I know a lot of trainers. I know. Uh, Aiden at his work riders at home. He has the walkie-talkie in their ear when they're riding along, riding walking. He's going along in the jeep. But I always had that worry. You know, like uh, Formula One drivers has their the cockpit in their ear chatting to them. If ever sometime in the in the future, in the distant future, if we were ever to um, sort of have microphones, not to obviously betting purposes, but for connections with the pace of the race and whatever, it'd be interesting in, in some time if that ever, ever comes don't say it. any more and we'll have a chat after the show and we'll we'll come up with a, a business idea that'll kind of transform both of our well certainly mine anyway i think you're all right for cash but uh yes yeah, just stay on the line after <laughs> um, <laughs> always be closing johnny we love it uh, how how did the connection come about because obviously this is is a horse and the relationship that has you know changed your career in many ways when was the first time that you were mooted to be uh, involved with Mishriff and how did how did that happen? So I rode a horse for Mr. Gosden, uh, not Mishriff, another filly called Magical Rhythm, I think she was called. It was about two two years ago now and it was at Kempton and she won. Um, just a spare ride on a, a normal weekday at Kempton, handicap, she went and won and um, Mishriff was running in the next couple of weeks. He had already had two runs, finishing placed on both occasions. And uh, I was called up by Mr. Gosden's office, rang my agent to say the prince wanted me to ride this horse called Mishriff in a Nottingham Maiden over a mile on bottomless ground. So I was delighted to get another ride from Mr. Gosden. Um, that was my only connection with uh, Prince Faisal. Um, when Mishriff went and won his maiden by 10 lengths going away on the bridle and uh, that was my first connection with, with Mishriff. Then after that, the prince wanted to uh, retain me for the following season and then that's when I travelled over to Riyadh to ride Mishriff in the Saudi Derby and we ran a very good race finishing second behind a good Japanese horse. Uh, Mishriff used a bit more um, not street-wise and he used to be a horse that used to tend to break very slowly. 
he broke slowly at Riyadh in the derby and I thought that probably did cost him the race that day. He came from the back of the field and he came with a lovely long run up the straight and finished strongly but just got beat by a Japanese horse. But uh, that's my first connection with Mishriff and uh, Prince Faisal. And they obviously stuck with you after that. Yeah, stuck with me for the pursuing future then when I'm Mishriff and he won in Newmarket on the Rolly Mile. Unfortunately, I couldn't ride him in the Prix de Jockey Club, the French Derby, because of uh, quarantine. I would have had to quarantine seven days before I went there, and it was too late by the time I could decide to go. So, Iret Mendizabal rode him that day. Obviously, a bit frustrating that I couldn't get to ride him being retained by Prince Faisal, but that's something I had to put up with. And uh, obviously, I was excited to get on him again, but unfortunately, due to um, a little four-day suspension I got. I wasn't able to ride him the next time in Deauville when Frankie got the mount. He went and won their group two. After that, he went to the champion stakes where Prince Faisal decided to keep Frankie aboard because he won on the last day at Deauville and whatever reason, the ground or he didn't seem to run his race that day. So we put a line through that and uh, thankfully we got got back aboard. Can, can I ask you then, so after Ascot, were you like, uh, might have lost the ride here? And was there a part for you, you're a young lad, and a lot of young jockeys might kind of, um, you know, they'd be annoyed about that and they might act badly, um, and this year might never have happened, or did you just say, whatever happens, happens, and, you know, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll you know, I obviously won't burn bridges here? No, I definitely didn't burn bridges, and I always said to myself and said to Prince Faisal, it comes in roundabouts. It'll be a time where I'll start jocking other people off or people get jocked me off. It's all part of the game and you have to put up with it. I think it was it was great to have my... Um, oh, sorry. I grew up in racing and understand the ins and outs of it and know there's a lot of people, if you annoy someone or piss off someone for one reason or another, that'll spread and people will hear it and your um, people's outlook on you as a person will be in effect of getting a ride on another horse for a completely different connection. So uh, it's something I grew up knowing. I have to uh, be very um, independent and not throw my toys out of the pram when things don't go your way. And thankfully for me, because I did that, I did get a chance to get back on them and I proved I can get the job done. I mean, it was a real shame that they were jocking you off for somebody with, you know, not not much of a track record in Frankie de Tori. Journey, like, journeyman vet. Okay, I can accept this. There's one time you can jock me off of Frankie de Tori and that's it. Yeah, look, it's he's the best in the world, isn't he? So to get jocked off by Frankie de Tori, it wasn't... Uh, obviously, I was annoyed and then I couldn't ride him. But look, that's racing. Got to put up with and I always said if I ever get the chance, I'd love to ride him again if... if if you'd like me to and thankfully after he ran in the champion stakes Prince Faisal uh, rang me himself and said uh, look the horse hasn't run his race but, but I'd really like you to get back on him and ride him in the Saudi Cup so uh, thankfully because I didn't burn a bridges that phone call came about and I won the world's richest race and whatever else after that so it's it's fantastic what is the Saudi Cup actually like because I don't don't think really any of us have any actual concept of the event the occasion and and just how important it is in a career it's just the proviso yeah. again is that it did happen during it was in February so it wasn't obviously what it might have been in terms of the local kind of celebration or whatever but what was it like anyway yeah Sure, yeah. So obviously I was there at the first Saudi Cup when I rode Mishra in the Derby. So the three-year-old equivalent of the Saudi Cup. And uh, obviously there was fans back then. And um, I think the the, the Kuma horse win, win it that year. I thought, yeah, Louis Sires rode him. And uh, obviously this year, not as many fans, but still had some, I think there was... 3,000 people there and I think that was the first racetrack where I actually took part that year with fans so it was mm. nice to have sort of some sort of reception when we did come back from winning winning such a prestigious race like that obviously it was a great race to win but it wasn't a group one it's still a conditions race because it's in its early stages I think they probably need another year uh, to get the average ratings high enough so it can qualify as an international group one I think that's how the the race courses or whatever governing body decide whether a race is a group one or not. So uh, 
after I won that, when everything kind of died down and relaxed and I was taking it all in, I still knew I had that sort of group one to, to chase next. And thankfully you went to Dubai and got the job done there. What a what a year it's been and what a relationship with this horse as well, the the roller coaster and the topsy turvy nature of it. But like knowing how to handle the situation gives you the opportunity to get back on the horse and then you keep keep building and keep going and, and looks like it's gonna be a relationship for the next couple of years that takes you special places as well. I'm really interested you, you talked about kind of growing up and, and steeped in racing and all different aspects of racing as well. Was it inevitable in your head that you were always as a kid going to try and become a flat jockey? Was that the the one thing that you wanted to do? Um, as a young kid, probably not. Look, I loved going racing. I, uh, yeah. so going to school, I went to school in Milltown, just outside the Cora, uh, living with my mother and my brother and sister on the yard of my grandfather, Desi Hughes. I used to go to Kilbegan of a weekday, Ross Common, go to Ferry House in Punchestown on the weekends. So I grew up sort of following more jump racing. Um, yeah. Go on my granddad whenever whenever I could to the race courses. And I think that got my kind of bug for racing, not necessarily flat racing, but more jump racing. So uh, that's how it all started out. And then I started um, riding out for my grandfather, the old kind of old quiet chaser and trot him out the back. And after a while, I was riding out for a couple of weeks and a couple of months. I'd had my pony there and ride that, but after riding out for a couple of weeks or a couple of months, my grandfather said I had to uh, pull my finger out. I'm small enough to be a flat jockey. So he sent me down the road to uh, go and ask uh, Willie McCrory down the road at Rathbride to, uh, for a job. And from that day on, I went to Willie McCrory's age, sort of 13, 14 for every, every Saturday and Sunday until I left school at 16. Not a bad fella to have as your grandfather. Yeah, no, he was a great man, um, gentleman. I don't think I've met anyone to have a bad word to say about him. He was a legend both in the saddle and as a trainer and just a great person as well. Uh, there was, a, there seemed to be a, you know, the, the people that have come through his yard, obviously, and you know, some people came in, maybe had their had their difficulties in or in or out of the saddle, and um, he just seemed to have a great way with giving somebody a chance. And uh, like I was talking to Roger Lockman recently about that. Obviously, that the, was it the Central House moment in Leopardstown, the way he handled that. He he, I, I guess he was a he was a quiet man, but he seemed to see the bigger picture as well. Yeah, I remember that happening with with Roger, and he went in. Um, when Roger got off the horse, he just embraced him, took his arm around him, and brought him straight into the into the weigh room. So he was an absolute gentleman in every walk of life, whether it was racing or on a personal level. Um, no, he was fantastic and greatly missed. A slightly different man, though, in Willie McCreary. Yeah, look, <laughs> Willie was a fantastic boss. He was uh, hard but fair and a bit of crack as well along the way. He uh, sort of, he's... Uh, make you feel a little bit awkward as a 14 year old you wouldn't know half the time whether he's taking the piss out of you or he's serious so uh, i used to always think he was serious all the time and be half afraid of him but the more i kind of got to know him and got to know him from the yard i felt a lot more comfortable and i think that really uh obviously i was sort of riding out for my grandfather i was in my own comfort zone i knew all the lads from when i was growing up with from uh, so let's name a handful of lads you got roger riding out there you had Paddy Flood, Ian McCarthy, Brian Cooper, so many, so many jockeys coming through there that looked after me there when I was riding my pony out with the string. And when I went down to Willie's, I was a bit more shy and in my shell and it took me a couple of months to so they grow as a as a young man and uh, it was definitely a feather in my cap. When you when you left school at sixteen, obviously the, the plan was to become a, a professional jockey. How how soon do you turn professional? Is it straight away? And and when do you realise that actually this isn't just going to be a good career for you? That you're you know you're building a brilliant career already at this point. But when did you realise that you were good at this? Yeah, look for for anyone start now. I think if you if you don't aim high, you won't. If you don't shoot high, you won't aim high. So I um, went to school in Newbridge, in the Patricia Secondary School. I uh, did my junior sort and as every sort of young jockey wants to get out and leave school and want to be a jockey and get their first ride straight away but because i was actually a young uh for my year and i would have been sort of just borderline 14 15 do my junior sort so i couldn't actually legally leave school until i was 
15. So I ended up doing, skipping a uh, transition year, going straight into fifth year and persuaded my uh, mother eventually that I'd go and give England a go for a year and try and make a go at it. And if it didn't work out or it changed my mind, I had spoken to my principal in the school that I could come back and do six year again. So um, it was uh, all concentrating my exams to make sure I passed and did well in them. And then once I left left school and left Willie's, I made the trip over to, to Newmarket to the British Racing School. It's mad, isn't it? Like it, it you know, because I know obviously you've got family connections in the UK as well, so it's less maybe uh, a, a leap. But sixteen leaving home where it has been for ages to go and live and work and try and make it is um it's ballsy yeah look i, I was lucky to have uh, my father at the time he took a bit of time away from the saddle he was running a uh, stud farm for a good friend of his Khaled Abdul Rahim Friarstown stud um so when we moved over to Ireland, I think it was about nine or 10, he moved back and concentrated on the farm. And he still had a couple of rides every year. He took out his training license and had a go training and trained a few winners and rode a few as well. But when I decided to make the move over, he was going back race riding anyway as well. So it worked out well that I had him as a base in Newmarket and I lived with him up until only this year. So, uh, it was good to have him there as a base. So I was moving away from home, but I still had sort of him look after me as well. And as a young flat jockey, is is England really the place where you want to go because the competition is there, the amount of rides that you're going to get, the opportunity to maybe make some mistakes and it not be parsed as uh, publicly by the people in your locality? Is it, is it just easier in a way to be to be there in terms of where the, that's where the work is and that's where the opportunities are going to be a bit more. Yeah, I think especially for an apprentice, um, me looking out from, say, an outsider point of view, looking at the standard of riders, I'm watching these apprentices riding in Ireland and they're top class. And you could be, you could be a top class rider as an apprentice in Ireland and not stand out because there'd be 10, 20 other apprentices that are seven five pound claimers that are riding as good as jockeys. And maybe the opportunities aren't there because of the sort of, there's not as many horses, there's not as many, not as much race. And it's just a lot tougher to kind of break through. And I think that's something my parents understood, my mom being a trainer, my dad being a jockey, that they understood going to England would make you sort of, a fish in a bigger sort of pool and give you a better chance to break through and make it than it would in Ireland. Look, not saying if I did stay in Ireland, I wouldn't make it, but I just thought from a, I wouldn't call it a business point of view, but for the chance of me making it as a jockey, I had a better chance of making it going to England and, uh, that's what I did and I've uh, never looked back since. Well, it obviously worked out. So, um, look, you've been really good with your time and I know you, you've got to get ready for your next race as well. So, uh, last couple of questions for me. What's next for you? Like, how do you how do you keep, you talked earlier on about aiming high, how do you make sure that this isn't a peak for you? Because so many great careers have peaks early and then more peaks later on. But to be able to drive on, what do you need to do on a personal level? Um, look, just keep getting, um, getting results, whether it's a group one or it's a, claimer in Lingfield I'll be doing my best to ride win on any horse I ride but obviously to ride top class horses in big races around the world and get the job done for connections obviously I've got a very good backing in uh, Roger Varian and Prince Faisal they're just to name two people that really support me here but uh, look as long as I can keep getting the job done hopefully the the opportunities will keep coming what are you riding? I think your next ride is in about 40 minutes or an hour. So what's the, what are you on? Yeah, he's a lovely horse. He's called Broad Spear. He had his first run in Salisbury, finished second. Um, it's the convivial maiden. So it's a 70 grand maiden. So it's the richest, richest maiden of the year. So obviously a lot of good horses will be coming to here, but he's a horse we like. Hopefully he handles the quick ground. It was soft ground the first day, but uh, yeah, hopefully he's got a winning chance. All right. Listen, it's been brilliant uh, having you on the show. I, I you know, uh, it's great to hear these stories and the, the year that you're in the middle of is going to be one of those career years, no matter what happens for the rest of your career. So congratulations and thanks a million for joining us. 
No, thanks, thanks for having me, David. David. Thank you. Cheers. Right, that that is a, an absolutely sensational story. You can get him on Twitter at David Egan ninety nine, and that's. Uh, I presume the year he was born as yeah, opposed to... Yeah, God, I was not, doing my leave and start that year, was I? It's not like a tribute to a Jay-Z song or a Nina song for those of you who are of a certain age. Yeah, um, it's a good point he makes. So, like, if you look about the Irish, uh, for instance, like Siobhan Rutledge, just looking at her here, one winner in her first two seasons and then 26 in a season and a half since. Um, you know, some jockeys can be good and just take an age to get going in Ireland because it's it's just less ra less racing, obviously bigger fields um, and intense competition. Intense competition, um, you know, and I think I think it's accepted that there is a there is a particularly strong generation of young riders now, and uh, you know he wouldn't be getting the ride on Mishriff if he'd stayed in Ireland, and that's just the way it is. And um, I think it's nice that the owner was you know loyal to him because he'd what he three three spins without him. And the young man has made an absolute fortune this year riding the horse. Like, let's not under understate that. It's it's um, what was that Spike Milligan line? Like, it's life is hard, but like having a few quid makes it vaguely less miserable or something. But he has set he's set for life now. You know, he's he can good buy, butchering he, of the quote there. Yeah. yeah. So when you're talking terrible, about this, terrible uh, butchering, of the, but he he can so, set himself up in life and have a have a you know not be scrimping and and just like he can buy a house. Context, he can, put context he, on that. So ten million prize money is what Mishriff has won. Yeah, like he's so he's what eight to, eight to ten percent of that or whatever. That's Mishriff alone. He's won a lot of races himself this year. Um, like, I mean, I'd be delighted for him though because he comes across so well. Ab absolutely, and um, I have to say, like he's uh, you know he's he mentioned his grandfather there. That was a great ground, and um, you know I'd, I'd I just I, for people who are unfamiliar, you're talking about Desi Hughes. Desi Hughes, yeah. Um, so people would be familiar with Hardy Eustace. He would have trained. Yeah, Hardy, Eustace. Hardy Eustace, and obviously going back to. Um, all his days as a rider and all that, Monksfield and um, I just great time for Desi Hughes when he when he passed away. I think the funeral was testament to just what a proper man he was, and um, you know it was it was desperately sad. Like he, you mentioned, he mentioned Ian McCarthy there. We did Ian McCarthy on a couple of weeks ago. Was it you know um, talking talking about Desi and all that? But it was a great grounding and being sent. Like I remember when I was fifteen, I went to America for like seven or eight weeks, and I was buzzing with excitement for like months and months and months and I remember sitting on the beach like looking looking at this glorious beach one day and being desperately desperately homesick at 15 and it's not easy for jockeys it isn't do you it know isn't. and I was surrounded by all my cousins and I was surrounded by so a jockey could go over now he went to William McCurry but these these guys and like footballers have done it as well they go to they go to a different country and um, they, they might be living in digs bed sits or whatever it is it's very very tough and um, he had a good ground and he, I'm sure it, Desi did it when he knew it was right, and I, I've great like memories of watching Desi with him and his brother and sister, particularly his, his, his I think his elder brother, always racing and like places like Kilbegan and that, like in the summer circus where Desi'd have winners. We'll we'll get him on for a longer interview when the off season is on and he's not racing away to uh, to a race. Um, but it was uh, a great introduction, properly, and we're delighted to have had him on the show today. So as I said. You can uh, get him on Twitter there and uh, at David Egan 99 is the Twitter handle if you want to follow his career. Friday Night Racing on Off the Ball is brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. Love every racing moment. Visit hri.ie. I'm just going to read this because, you know, uh, it says I have to. Some shrewd transfer window business by me, brackets chair, sees me, Leapfrog Johnny, in the tote 10 to follow. Mishriff made the distance. Difference. Delivering 53.75 points after his win at York on Wednesday. I added St. Mark's Basilica, um, who obviously hammered Mishriff when they previously met, and then was told by uh, the good man uh, in the tote afterwards that um, yeah he's just gotten injured. Like so, it must have literally happened while I transferred him. Like he was, well, yeah, he I must mean, have the, the pain must have like literally just hit him at that time. So that was that was a disaster. There's no two ways of putting. We obviously wish the horse all the best, but he mm. must be some kind of weird Jonah figure. Yeah, it was disappointing. I added Snowfall, which wasn't exactly uh, very original. So that obviously, I'm well, sure you. I'm going to go through this. Yeah. So Tom, Johnny, and I have all taken the same points for Snowfall's win because we all subbed in Snowfall. Visit Tote.ie to receive a 10% boost on all Irish and UK racing dividends with Tote Plus. Tom took out Patash and Mogul Barb. Uh, and put in Snowfall and Golden Pal. You took out Wembley and Pretty Gorgeous and put in Snowfall and St. Mark's Basilica. And I took out Mogul and Subjectivist and put in Snowfall and Mishriff. I did get a bit of help. But I'm leading. That's what that means. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was kind of like <laughs> I basically somebody injured who's coming off, and I replaced him with nobody because my 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 sub is like, well, actually, I'm injured as well. So I was a bit screwed, to be fair. 
There you go. It is what it is. But in, in terms of the tote, it should be mentioned. I was talking to Tim Husbands from Leprestown today, and um, this was, I think, pointed out in the show before, but when Champions Weekend is on, however many amount of people are going to be there, um, the tote pool is going to be like massively boosted from Hong Kong. Um, so uh, that's going to be very interesting, and uh, it's going to be a big, big pool. All right, well, we'll talk about that again a bit more closer to the time. This weekend, and also the, the racing at York, it's been a pretty interesting week, but this weekend at the Curragh, good stuff too? Yeah, the debutante and the futurity stakes. Um, Point Longsdale, who's unbeaten, obviously won a Royal Ascot. He's running in the futurity. Um, that was run that, won last year by Max Sweeney, and um, he should win, but it, it may not be a cakewalk for him. It's, it's, it's a good race, and um, I think the, the more interesting of the two races... It, by the way, the card starts with three two-year-old maidens, which either is or isn't your cup of tea. I think it's fascinating. Some amazing pedigrees, some really good horses. Um, Jim Bulger has a horse running in the second race. Um, Crack at dawn, I think it is, uh, which I think will take an awful lot of beating, but he looks a lovely horse. But in, in any event, then, in the debutante, it's called the Alpha Centauri Debutante Stakes and Alpha Centauri's Full Sister Discoveries is going to be a big fancy there, which takes right. on Concert Hall, Twinkle, and it's an eight-runner race, an absolute cracker. OK. That's on Saturday. That both both race on Saturday. Killarney as well. Really good card down there. Jumps meet and um, if you were, I, I I was saying this in my tip and pieces racing TV. If you did pick a day, just like lays about on the couch between York, the Killarney, the early card into the Curra, Liverpool playing the early football game. There's loads on, and you can just kind of enjoy the sport. That's Saturday. Uh, are are there any of these jumps races at the moment that will have like if you're a uh, an autumn campaigner jumps horse is now where you're kind of starting to see some and show some form like I guess I'm, I'm saying these these aren't some of the horses that we see in Clarny this weekend probably aren't going to be peaking in February and March next no, year no no so like I suppose I don't know what you call it, maybe into the stall which is late next month and interestingly with with regard to crowd might be just after the next raft of kind of um Less, le lessening of restrictions or whatever um, but Lestol is kind of like the, the Kerry National has such a big pot there and then your summer horse might stretch out to the Munster National in, in Limerick um, but the, I suppose the jumps the good jumps winter horses are they're just coming back into training now really they won't be seen till later on um, and the, in fairness the ground has it's been a decent summer the ground has held up I mean I don't think anyone's ever, everyone's remarkably worried about global warming, but Ireland hasn't been bad at all, in fairness, this year, and the ground has held up um, reasonably well. It hasn't been, like, really firm or it hasn't been desperately soft, so hopefully, like, I don't know what's going to happen in the winter, but th those horses are just coming back into training. All right, good stuff, Johnny. Thanks a million. Enjoy the weekend's racing. You too, Ger. Friday Night Racing on Off the Ball is brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. Love every racing moment. Visit hri.ie. We'll see you next week. Friday Night Racing on Off the Ball. Brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. Love every racing moment. Visit hri.ie.